Praise the Lord. Amen. We gather around the Lord's table today, and it is true, that song. It is a gospel-centered song. It is a Christ-centered song. How beautiful is the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote to the early church, and he said this, For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, In the same way he also took the cup, after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Well, gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for that precious body, that beautiful body that was broken for us, your son, Jesus Christ. And it is to him that we come and we praise this morning. God, we ask that you would remove the burdens and the things that um, weigh us down today, that we might hear from you clearly. God, thank you for each and every person that you have brought here today. Lord, we love you. And God, in this short pilgrimage <clears throat> that we have in this life, may we be sold out for you, living for you in every way, shape, and form. We come together, Father, with one voice as one church, your bride, as that song said, your bride, to pray that prayer that your son taught us to pray when he said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Well, church, awesome worship. Are you happy that you came to the house of the Lord? That's what the psalmist said. I rejoiced. Yes, I rejoiced when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Um, we get to gather as the body of Christ and just lift up his name. Well, we have... Um, we are today concluding this series that we've done. It's called Uncharted. And if you're new with us, it's first, your first day. You're here on the last day of this sermon series. But I hope that it blesses you. I hope the way that I've handled it has been a blessing to you. Of course, I'm going on sabbatical. And here's what I want you to know is um, my wife said to me, she goes, there's no way you're going to be able to stay away from the church for seven weeks. And, and it literally, if you know me, I love being at church. I just love the church. I love the people. I'm, I, I, that's why we have a Saturday night service. People go, how do you do Saturday night? It's like, because I'd be here Friday night. I do church Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, Sunday afternoon, if I could. I just be, I love the church and I love the people. I love being amongst God's people and talking about God's things. So um, what I'm going to do over the seven, the next seven weeks that I'm gone is I'm going to visit a lot of other churches and I'm going to soak it in and it's going to be awesome. So if you have a good recommendation for a church in Southern California, Northern California or Colorado, you let me know. And if I can get there, I will get there. Um, when we get back, folks, this is the series. I'm gonna, I've already got the series that I know that we are gonna we are gonna do. We're gonna be doing a series called Driven. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul says, Look, the love of Christ, it compels me, it drives me, it, it consumes me. This is what Paul said. It reminds me of what Jesus said. Zeal for your house consumes me. These were men that were driven in their generation. Guess who's going to be driven in this generation? You and me, you and me. So when we get back, that's a series. I can hardly even wait. I've already started on it, and um, I'm going to be sitting on it for seven weeks, just eager to get in and get back. So uh, be excited for that series as it starts. Next week, I, um, Al Fadi, he is a, um, yeah, a friend of this church. Many of you know him. You've heard his story. He is a Muslim that was converted. He converted to Christianity. He is going to come and share his story, his conversion out of Islam. He's going to be talking about Islam in the 21st century, answering a lot of questions. Um, an amazing story, a man of God who was transformed out of, again, Islam. So you want to be here next week for that for sure. Well, this series that we have been in has been uncharted. It's been called Uncharted, and it's what 
what to do when you find yourselves out in those uncharted waters. But I have a question for you this morning. What happens when you're not the one who's in in uncharted waters? What happens when it's someone else who is in uncharted waters? Listen, I praise God for the times in my life when things are calm, don't you? I mean, there's times where God just allows us to be in calm waters, and it's like, thank you, Lord. Thank you for these calm waters. But it's in those moments I have to remember there are people all around me who are themselves in uncharted waters. It could be a neighbor. It could be a friend or a family member. But there are people everywhere who are trying to navigate difficult um, situations in life. I guarantee you, everyone right now, you can think of at least one name or two names, friends or family members, people that are going through difficult times. They're out in uncharted waters. Uh, you can think of them right now. It's so easy to assume, and I don't know if you guys do this, I do this. Things are going well for me, so things must be going well for everybody else, right? I mean, that's just kind of the way I think. I'm going, hey, things are great for me. Things must be great for everyone else. But the truth is, again, there are people everywhere who are in uncharted waters themselves, people who are experiencing trials, difficulties, loss. These people are putting on a brave face, as we often do, when in fact they're feeling very alone and very scared. So in this series, we have talked about some of the reasons that God takes us out into uncharted waters. But you want to know one of the biggest reasons that God has taken you out into the waters that he has had you in in your life? Some of you are here today and you have been in very rough waters in your life. You've experienced tough things. You want to know why God has taken you where he's taken you? Here's one of the biggest reasons, folks. It is so that you are a prepared Christian. It is to prepare us. Specifically, it is to prepare us so that we can come alongside of others in their time of need. See, this is why you've been set in this generation. You understand why you're here. God has set you in this generation to be his ambassador, to be his hands and feet, to be the beautiful hands and feet of Jesus to this world. And folks, one of the greatest ways that we as Christians will ever impact another person for Jesus Christ is when we come alongside of them in their time of need. Is that true? Amen. Amen. When when we find people who are in uncharted waters and we swim out to them, and buoy them up, and we come alongside of them, and we wrap our arms around them, the impact for Christ is tremendous in those moments. The Apostle Paul, he starts the book of 2 Corinthians. I love how he starts the book of 2 Corinthians. He starts it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, Now listen to this, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I love this description of God in this passage, don't you? He is the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. This is the God that you follow. Do you know that? Who is the God that you follow? He is the father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. And it makes me wonder, when people think about me, do they see me as a person of mercy and comfort? When people are in uncharted waters, when they're hurting, when they're drowning, do they go, I'm going to go to Bill because he's a man of comfort and mercy? It makes me wonder. Now, if you are a child of God, you know what God is ultimately doing in your life, right? Right? He has set you in this generation to be an ambassador for him, but you know what he's ultimately doing in your life, right? He's conforming you to the image of his son. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many Brethren, God has a goal for your life. Do you know this? You may not even have a goal for your life, but God has a goal for your life. You know what God's goal for your life is? To conform you into the image of his son. Now, brace yourselves, because you may not know this. Jesus had a reputation for being a man of mercy and comfort. And this is what God is transforming you and me into people of compassion and mercy and comfort. Let's face it, 
You know it and I know it. This world is brutal. It's brutal for us as Christians. It's brutal to be a non-Christian in this world. Where do you look? Where do people go when they need compassion? My prayer is that when anyone, Christian or non-Christian, needs, uh, is out in uncharted waters and needs comfort and mercy, the first thing they think of is, I'm going to the Christians that I know. I'm going to the church that I know. Truly, truly amazing. Now, Jesus, of course, was constantly showing mercy and comfort everywhere he went. And this brings us to the text that I want us to look at today. So this is all in way of introduction to this text. So church, hear the word of God. Hear the word of God. By the way, you want to know the most powerful thing on earth? It is not the nuclear weapons that I see that where the United States is fretting about in North Korea. The most powerful thing in the world is the word of God on that screen right there. Church, hear the word of God. Let it pierce your hearts. Let it pierce your hearts. The infallible, awesome, powerful, living word of God. Luke 18. As he, that is Jesus, drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. What's going on? I can't see. I can only hear. What is going on? And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, son of David, son of David. Now listen to this, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I am a man in need of mercy. I am in uncharted waters. I am blind. Have mercy on me. And those who were in front of him rebuked him, telling him, be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, say it with me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things from this passage. First and foremost, the blind man was literally begging for mercy. The people even told him to stop, but he was begging for mercy. And it makes me think of all the people around me who are literally begging for someone, anyone, to show them mercy. Now, unfortunately, we live in a society where we are trained to do something um, from, from our youth. We are trained to do this. We're trained to put on a brave face, aren't we? Even when we come to church, we are trained to put on a brave face. You might be crushed inside spiritually and emotionally and physically, but you put on that brave face. Now, that's hard for you and me because as Christians, it's hard sometimes to recognize those around us who are drowning. But folks, don't be mistaken. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. And their cries for someone to show them mercy and comfort can come in all different ways. That is why one of the most powerful prayers that you can ever pray, you want to know one of the most powerful prayers you can ever pray? Is God, let me see the world through your eyes. <laughs> let me see the world through your eyes. You know what's going to happen when you pray that prayer? You're going to start seeing people through God's eyes. People are just going to pop off and they're going to pop into your face and you're going to go, who are you? Why are you here? And you're going to see them. Their cries for mercy can be small and subtle, but with God's help, you will, you will see them and you will hear them when others won't. There are people all around us who are literally being crushed by the weight of the world and need someone to come and help carry their burdens. Compassionate people who will swim out into those uncharted waters and buoy them up and wrap their arms around them and say, I am here for you. I am a child of God and I am here for you. Now, I want you to notice something else in this passage. It says this, as he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting on the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, the crowd that was with Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front of him rebuked him, telling him, be silent. But he cried out, all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Listen. Listen. This blind man is rebuked by people who honestly might have been well-intentioned. Because I don't want to cast stones at them. They were probably very well-intentioned. Let me stress that. 
But there is a lesson in this for you and I as Christians. And it is this. We, meaning the church, we, meaning the the children of God, those who profess Christ, we, the church, are first and and foremost a people of mercy, comfort, and compassion. See, once we lose sight of this, no matter how well-intentioned we might be, we have missed the heart of why God has us here. Do you know why you are here in this generation? God has set your feet in this generation to be an ambassador for him. And if we miss that, we've missed everything. We've missed the heart of the gospel. What is the heart of the gospel, folks? The gospel, the good news, is all about a God of mercy and compassion who sent his one and only son into the world to die for sinners like you and me. That's why Paul wrote this. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, I might be the greatest, most powerful person you've ever met. I can do amazing spiritual things. I can move mountains with my faith. But he says this, but if I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Again, no matter how well-intentioned you and I might be, if our intentions as Christians aren't grounded in love and compassion, mercy and grace, I mean, this is what the world is dying for. It is a brutal world. You know it. We've come here every Sunday beat up by the world and we we get rest and reprieve because we get to worship with other Christians. But think about all the people that are out there that have nowhere to turn. But this is where it gets really amazing. I want you to notice something else from this passage. It blows my mind away. And Jesus said to him, this is at the end of the passage where Jesus, he, he heals him. Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. Jesus stops Jesus isn't too busy to to, to minister to this man. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Truly amazing. It's a very simple principle, folks. It's a spiritual principle that you have to know, but let me tell you, when God's people show mercy, God's name instinctively gets praised. Now, I think there's a typo up there, is there? Gets shouldn't have an apostrophe, am I right? I saw this in my notes, and somebody pointed it out last, last, last night, so I'm just going to point it out right now, because I know some of you English people out there are, you, I, I was going to lose you if I didn't say something, right? <laughs> right? So let's just get that out of the way right now. But listen to me, don't miss the point, despite my lack. By the way, God gave me a spiritual gift. Do you know what it is? A very rare spiritual gift. I have the gift of spelling words multiple ways. Uh, It's a very, very, very interesting gift to have. Listen, this is the most amazing thing. God's name doesn't get praised when we get political. God's name doesn't get praised when we are judgmental. God's name gets praised instinctively when we show mercy. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and what? And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial here, but since I'm going on sabbatical, I think now is the time to do it. I have seven weeks to (laughs) run and hide. I think one of the big reasons that Christians in America are disliked, and I think, I think you'd all agree with me, to, at least I feel it on, you watch the news, and Christians aren't, we don't have the best reputation, is because we are spending a, tre- a tremendous amount of energy trying to force our morals on non-believers, specifically through politics, when what they really need from the church is compassion, mercy, and love. Remember, Remember what God's word says. They will know we are Christians by our what? By our love, not our judging. They will know we are Christians by our love. Now, does that mean we compromise our values? Not at all. But trying to get a non-believer to act like a believer, I'm missing the point. When they're drowning, what they need is a believer that comes alongside and, and says, I'm here for you. I may not agree with you, I may not agree with your lifestyle, but I love you, and I'm here for you. I'll sw- I, have sw- I will swim out into the uncharted waters that you are in where you are drowning. No questions asked. I won't judge you. I will love you. 
I'm here for you. See, we need to remember that like Christ, we have to proceed in grace and truth, right? What does it say about Jesus? For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You want to know, now here's the deal. I know many of you are in relationships with people who are drowning, who are in uncharted waters, and, you, and it's hard to know when do I speak truth to them and when do I just show grace and mercy to them. I don't always know the answer to that question. It really, that's a hard one to balance. And I just say, if you, if you need direction, look to Christ. Read the scriptures because he was a man full of grace and truth because there are times when we do need to speak truth to people. But there are other times that we just need to show them mercy. And again, where is that line? I don't always know. Especially when it's a close family member. It's like, oh, where? You know, I want to strangle you, but I also want to hug you. And I don't know which one to do right now. Here's the deal, though. As we show grace and compassion and kindness to people who are out in uncharted waters, who are drowning before our very eyes, they are going to praise God when we come alongside of them and support them. We won't even have to tell them to praise God. They will just do it. Now, I know many of you can relate to what I'm about to say, so listen very carefully because this has happened to you. and You probably... You might not even realize this has happened to you, but this has happened to you. You have come along somebody in their time of need, and they spontaneously started praising God, and you might not have even recognized it. They start saying things like, you help them, and they're like, whew, praise God that you came along. And you don't even think that they just said that, but guess what they just did? They praised God that you just came along. Praise God for your help, or I'm so thankful to God that you were here today for me. They start praising the name of God. Listen, some of you are here today, and you have been through some really rough, uncharted waters yourself. And I mean really rough, uncharted waters. Know for certain, listen folks, know for certain you were not in those waters for no reason. God was preparing you to be his ambassador in this generation, a vessel of mercy and grace. Folks, there are people, this is so very important, and please listen to me, there are people that only you can reach. Do you know this? Because you have been in the waters, the same uncharted waters that they have been in. As a result, you can relate to them and they can relate to you. Here's the deal, they will only listen to you. There are some people that will only listen to you because you have a credibility in their, in their eyes. And you know why? Because you have swum in the same waters that they're currently swimming in. And so you have a credibility that I don't have. You have a credibility that others don't have because you know the waters they are in. They will listen to you when they won't listen to others. You wonder why God has put you through what she has put you through? I guarantee you, here's why, folks, because there are people out there that are, that are gonna listen to you. You're gonna come alongside and say, I know what you're going through because I went through it myself. And you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna go, talk to me because I need somebody right now because I am drowning. I am drowning. By the way, the blind man that Jesus healed, I wonder what he ended up doing with the rest of his life. I don't totally know, but I can tell you this. I bet when he encountered other blind people, he had a compassionate heart for them and that he could talk to them in a way that they could relate and understand. In a way that only, he could talk to them in a way that no one else could because he had been in the same waters that they had been in. And that's the point, folks. There are waters that you have been um, in that uniquely qualify you to reach certain people, people I can't reach, and again, that no one else can reach. Your pain is never in vain. Know that. There is nothing, folks, that has ever happened in your life that is going to waste or that will go to waste. God will use it if you will offer it to him. Say, God, I am here. Give me your eyes to see. And God will give you his eyes to see. And you know what you'll see? You'll see people that are drowning and you'll go, I know what it's like to be in those waters. I was in those waters and you're going to swim out to them and they are going to praise the name of God for you. They're going to say, praise God that you came out to me. 
Your pain is never in vain, ever. When you fulfill your calling as an agent of mercy and compassion in this generation, people are going to praise God. And think about it, folks, for a minute. Non-Christians who rarely ever think about God, non-Christians who will never even listen to you, might not even believe that there is a God, will suddenly start praising the name of God. Why? Because you were political with them? Why? Because you were trying to force your morals on them? No, because you were kind to them. You were compassionate to them in their time of need. You were gentle, meek, and mild with them. And there are moments of weakness when they were drowning. You came to them and you wrapped your arms around them. Again, it doesn't mean that you would agree with everything that they are doing or stand for. But you love them. You love them. You know this scripture well. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. You know what this verse is calling each of us to do, folks? It's calling us to be discerning. Be discerning. Look around. There are people over here that are rejoicing. We come alongside of them in their time and we rejoice with them as Christians. Praise God. Praise God that God is blessing you. And by the way, that's what we do when people are blessed and they're rejoicing. This is what you do is you come alongside of them and you point them to Christ. You say, you know where every good and perfect gift comes from? It comes from the Heavenly Father above. But in the same way, we weep with those who weep There are those out in waters and they are crying, they are weeping, they are drowning. Who in the world is going to come to them? You know who in the world is going to come to them? The Christians are. The Christians. Not the government. Not some other religion. Us. It is Christians. We are going to be the ambassadors that swim out into the uncharted waters to minister. Kathleen, who was just up here, she's going to Peru. We're sending nine people from this church, Dina Brinkman, Maxine Waters, I don't know if she's in here. We're sending nine people, Patrick Cassidy, they're going down to Peru, vessels of mercy. They're going in in, uh, July. I'm saying, I I said it, Peru's not going to know what hit them when these nine people from Arizona Community Church show up, full of grace, truth, mercy, compassion, the love of Christ, gospel-centered centered people who have an eternal perspective, who are sold out for God, storing up treasures in heaven. I truly believe that as Christians, the more discerning we are to the needs of those that God has put into our life, our impact in this generation will be historic. Again, they will know we are Christians, not by our politics, by our love. Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Dr. Len Baker over here, this is the man that knows Galatians better than any other man I know. How do you please God? It is Christ in you, flowing through you, living his life through you. What what is the greatest commandment according to Jesus? The two greatest commandments. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then I'll listen to verse 40. All these, uh, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Folks, you do not have to be a theologian or an expert in the Old Testament to know how to fulfill the law of Christ. It is simple. Let Christ live his life through you. You love God and you love others. By the way, if you want a vivid picture, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with this. You want a vivid picture. I, I ran across a picture on the internet two years ago, about two years ago, and it hit me when I saw it. I, le- I fell in love with it. I don't know who the artist was, but I fell, in love with, I fell in love with it. Remember when Jesus walked out to the disciples on water? And what did Peter say? He said, Lord, let me get out of the boat and walk with you on water. And Jesus said, Come. Come. And Peter gets out and he starts walking on water, but then Peter sees the wind and he becomes afraid and he begins to sink. And what does Matthew 14 say? Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. And if you can see that picture right there, it's a picture of Christ standing on the water, reaching his hand down into the water. It was just such a powerful picture. When I saw that picture on the internet, I was like, wow. That is what we as Christians are. We are people that are reaching out to people. Look at what it says. Jesus, what's that second word right there say? Immediately. Immediately. Folks, never worry about setting aside temporal things to do the eternal. 
The lawn can be fertilized another day. Yes, the kitchen can be cleaned another day. The laundry can be done another day. Never, never worry about setting aside the temporal to do the eternal. Jesus immediately reached out his hands. Folks, when God gives you the opportunity to minister to somebody who is out in uncharted waters, take advantage of it. You know why? Because life is short and the opportunities are few. And you have been set in this generation as ambassadors for Christ. You and me of all people, who would have thought? Seven billion people on the planet being crushed. The stress in this generation is unheard of. The technology and just trying to keep up, people are, people are drowning everywhere. And guess who God has called? You and me. Who would have thought? Who would have thought the 21st century, nuclear arms, internet, computers, and the things that the world could never have dreamed of are all in packed in this generation, and he's put you and I here in this generation. So, I'm leaving for seven weeks. So I'm going to leave you with a challenge. It's a challenge I'm going to live, try to live. But the challenge is simple. Look for one person, just one, this week. The danger is that God's going to give you 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50. Be prepared. Look for one person this week who is out in uncharted waters. It might be your waiter or waitress, the person at Starbucks. It might be a neighbor. It might be a friend. It might be somebody that you never expected or never saw coming. Just say, God, give me your eyes to see. Look for one person who is out in uncharted waters and you come alongside them with the love, comfort, compassion of Christ and you watch what happens. I bet you they start praising the name of God because you showed up. Amen? Let me pray. Father in heaven, we ask God in this short life that you have given us that you would make us awesome ambassadors for you in this generation, that we would give our lives away, lay them down for the sake of the gospel. God, let the, never, Father, let the temporal things of this world consume us to the point that we miss the eternal things that you set before us. God, we ask that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear those that are crying out for mercy. Just like the blind man in Jesus' generation, there are people all around us crying out for mercy. God, give us an eternal perspective. Let us set down the temporal things that are, that are calling and trying to get our attention. And God, let us with compassion, love, and mercy swim out to those in uncharted waters and wrap our arms around them. And God, I do pray that your name is praised, not only in the church, but in the world, that people would praise the name of God for the church and for the mercy and love that we show on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis. Right now in the quietness of your heart, I just want you to spend a minute with God. Ask him to give you eyes to see and ask him if there's anybody that he has already brought into your life that you might reach out to this week. Father, I pray for each person here and I pray your blessing upon this church. It is your church. Lord, I leave for seven weeks. It doesn't matter because you are the head of this church. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You reign supreme over this church. You neither sleep nor slumber. God, let this be an amazing summer at Arizona Community Church. And God, as we move into the fall, may amazing miracles happen. God, Bring people to us. Bring a hurting world to this church. And God, let us be your ambassadors. We love you. We thank you. And we pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. And the church said, amen. God bless you. Thank you. Be here next week. I'll see you in seven. God bless.